But anyway, like, um, I was going to ask a question. What these days do you think AI can do a lot better than um, humans? And what are humans a lot better uh, at doing than AIs? And so these AIs are pretty limited. We don't have any real, you know, AGI is the term that a lot of people are using, artificial general intelligence, something which can deal with every aspect of the world, you know, having cameras and being able to understand visually the environment, being able to converse, to both speak and listen, to be able to reason about the world and be able to manipulate the world, you know, like with robot arms. Uh, there are really no systems that can do that yet today. Uh, today's AI systems are very narrowly focused on particular tasks. And you know they're good at uh, checking credit report scores and predicting when somebody's likely to default on their loan. I mean that's a kind of a practical application that uh, you know is very very high value and uh, that those systems are better than people are uh, at, at doing. Um, you know as we go forward, I'm amazed. Like in this tragic uh, nuclear disaster in Japan, um, I think it's a, a travesty that we were sending that they were sending people into these reactors. You know, to get irradiated to fix things. I mean, my God, we should have robots that can do that kind of task. Especially you know, Japan. And in Japan, Japan is a robot <laughs> central. So, you know, that I found a very disturbing uh, sequence of events. Mm. Hopefully, we'll learn from that, though. Yeah, I hope so. But I mean, I think uh, maybe some of the cognitive things that um, AIs do are very good with maths and and um, but. It's AIs seem to be very bad at the moment compared to us per se, at operating in the environment. Um, yeah. It it the AI's ability to interpret visual information is is quite difficult. But it but I mean maybe it can do it in a different way to us um, and sort of short circuit the compl the complexity involved in doing so and and get there a lot quicker. It's a bit after all we don't know. Um, yeah. But, there's, you know, the, the one Microsoft of the most system. recent things is the Connect system that uh, yeah, the, the, the Microsoft the game tool from Microsoft, which Go is very, very good, and it, you know, uses some special technology for uh, mm -hmm. retrieving 3D data, mm -hmm. and that's an example of, of not doing it the way that people do it, but um, getting some, you know, nonetheless very valuable uh, input. And apparently lots of uh, labs now are starting to use these video game, you know, Connect systems uh, as, as one of their input devices. Have you used one of those before? Uh, we've got a hackerspace in Melbourne that does a bit of, um, you know, hacking with connects and flying oh, around great. quadcopters and whatnot. I haven't seen it in operation, so I would I would love to see that uh, maybe when I visit. Well, I'm hoping hackers hackerspace uh, might be coming to the Singularity Summit um, and oh, doing great. some demonstrations. We have got Ray Jarvis, who's have you ever heard of him? He's a uh, roboticist in Australia. He's pretty big. Um, he's the head of the um, the Monash Centre for Robotics. He's been doing stuff since um, the 80s. He's been quite oh, at least in Australia. He's okay. going to be demonstrating some some of the Nao robot um, oh, things. Yeah, he's got one of those, so that'll be fun watching it yeah. do whatever it needs to do. What it's whatever he's making this Nao robot do. I like the idea right. of demonstration. So. Um, I think Hackerspace uh, should be able to come along and do some stuff. It just adds an extra feel that people c can connect to a little bit more. You know, it, it gives people some form of ex accessibility to the technologies, makes people feel that they um, or it can be involved because not everybody has a PhD and um, has the time to commit to learning the backgrounds of all different types of AI programming techniques and then engineering this sort of stuff, let alone the finances to do so. But, you know. Exactly. At, at, get, I mean, at, at home sort of hackery can be fun <laughs> yeah I mean one of the trends I don't know if it's big in Australia but here mm. uh, high school students um, have these contests where they you know robots battle one another in, in various kinds of a task uh, uh, you know there are battle bots where they actually try and destroy one another and there are you know things where they try and play soccer robot soccer that kind of thing and uh, it's a wonderful way. I mean, the kids love it, and they learn a ton about uh, both about robotics and about technology and about what it takes to work as a team to build a system. And the competitions are very exciting, and they you know generate a lot of interest. And so, um, I think that's a, a wonderful trend. So, what's your favorite implementation of AI at the moment? Well, I've got my own systems, which unfortunately <laughs> we're not uh, being public with at the moment. Uh, yes. And uh, you know, I think every AI researcher thinks that their approach is is uh, much better in certain ways than other people's. 
And so, um, uh, you know, I'm very hopeful about my system. But I think, you know, there are a lot of researchers around the world that are exploring uh, different approaches that uh, I think there are quite a few exciting uh, exciting ones coming. The, the AGI conference in particular is neat because it often brings people from different camps who are trying to build whole AGI systems. So they're really trying to mimic, you know, the, the whole range of intelligent behaviors. And, um, and yet they often have very different perspectives. And so it's a nice place where they can get together and compare notes and sort of see which aspects are most important and which ones aren't. Totally wish I could be there um, to witness it. Um, I think it's one of those. I think it would be a great conference um, with a lot of uh, technical detail. But pretty much, it's for the AGI experts. But as just somebody who's got a keen interest in these subjects, I think it would be amazing. But I'm stuck here organising Singularity Summit in, in Australia. <laughs> too, <Damn>. I think. <laughs> And also, I think we're going to videotape the talk, so you may be able to watch them, you know, just for the technical content, but not for the, it's really the conversation in the hallway that's often the mm, most... Uh, absolutely. Important. Yeah. Well, part of the reason why I'm so keen on organizing this Singularity Summit and doing activities, because I get to meet you guys and I get to sort of hang out with people who um, are quite well versed in, in these uh, these developments, so it's it's all good for me. I mean, I get a, a lot of benefit from doing so. Oh, great. I, think, I think it's a great service that you're doing because it generates interest um, you know, in the general public and you know, the more people who are thinking about these questions, I think um, the better answers we're going to get. And um, you know, this is these kinds of questions, it's really about the future of humanity and the technology is a vehicle, but, but the questions are things that I think every person on the planet really should be thinking about and should have an opinion on. Yeah, I think so. I mean, and it will come that people will, everybody on the planet will be thinking about all these things. Um, and uh, in a sense, maybe we do need to sort of move away from the joking, uh, dispar disparaging comments about, okay, well, AI is just a Skynet, haha, you know, um, Terminator right. scenario, haha, <laughs> you believe in that. <laughs> Many people, you know, have only seen these movies, you know, like mm. uh, Terminator, Battlestar Galactica, or something, and most mm. of those paint a very dystopian future. Yeah. And if everybody's thinking about this future in this very dark, negative way, that's, you know, what we're going to tend to create. And so, uh, mm. one thing I would love to see is people creating visions that are much more positive, that, that something that we, you know, an environment that we'd really actually love to live in. Uh, and then that can serve to guide people to actually create that. Yeah, unfortunately, because of the what sells plot devices um, in films and novels and all that sort of stuff, it's you need to create some form of tension and something to yeah. some reason for somebody to fork out seventeen or whatever dollars it is in America to go and see one of these films. Um, you know, if you boot special effects, people dying, screams, explosions, and you know, just raw sheer power and then like um some unrealistic sort of assumptions it is um you'll have ais that are smarter than most people but then you'll get the special people who have this burning desire to to become like heroes or you know who have this sort of relentless undying spirit that kindles them and and then they overcome the ai threat exactly <laughs> yeah it's but interesting how many tv series and movies have the theme of people with special powers. Like I just started watching the Alphas is a new TV series out here that has that same kind of a, of a sense. I mean, it's, it's interesting the way that our media and our entertainment reflects sort of what's happening in the scientific world. Did you see Moon, the science no. fiction film? Oh, well, it's actually pretty good. The AI is voiced by Kevin Spacey. <laughs> it's great. Okay. Oh, it's a really good film. You should see it, man. Um, and and the AI is pretty good. Oh, I, I won't give away too much, but you know, it's a it's a more of a benevolent, benevolent, nice AI in some parts. Yeah. And the other one, the other film which I thought was kind of good was Bicentennial Man. Mm -hmm. um, but that was based on a novel by Isaac Asimov, was it? Bicentennial Man. I'm not sure, but yeah, I, I did see that film. That was quite interesting, I thought. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting, like how, how they sort of um, integrated robotics and uh, into the everyday world. And you had, you know, somebody sitting there with a new, an old newspaper, still reading it, like, you know, in the 19... 50s <laughs> and then an AI in in um, right next to it a robot right, walking around doing the dishes and operating in the world right next to it is is 
quite interesting contrast, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um, now, uh, I guess Nick Nick Bostrom, um, he's at the Future of Humanity Institute in Oxford, right? Yes. Yeah, that's right. And we got the Singularity Institute and the Foresight Institute and, and many others, and all discussing the idea of an existential threat or existential threats. Um, what does that mean? Does it mean there's a threat to existentialism? What about <laughs> well, existential they, opportunities? I mean, they're looking for um, situations that might lead to the end of the human race. So, end of the existence of humanity. Oh, okay. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I'm really glad they're thinking about it. You know, everything from asteroids hitting the Earth to, mm. you know, when is the sun going to go, you know, explode and destroy the planet, all those kinds of things. And AI is a potential uh, existential risk. If you know, we don't do it carefully, uh, the systems could you know, take over and uh, lead to uh, the end of humanity. I personally find it um, kind of depressing to think about those things. Um, but I think there's a subtler notion of existential risk, which is important to think about, even if you're not thinking about the you know, uh, death and destruction kinds of scenarios. And that is that... Um, you know, humanity survives in a wonderful, thriving way. We build these amazing machines. We solve all the problems. And yet something that today we would regard as very precious to ourselves is somehow lost in the process. And so, like today, there are, are things, you know, compassion, love, uh, you know, a love of children, uh, humor, enjoyment, poetry, uh, a sense of, you know, spiritual connection with the universe. All those things are, are very precious to many people. And... You know, there are scenarios in which uh, humanity survives, and yet we don't look anything like what we look like now. And so um, the kind of existential risk that I, I perhaps am most interested in is really identifying, you know, what are the values that we care most about, and how can we ensure that those thrive and survive in the future, and that we're not just, you know, human in name, but, you know, human in the sense of, of our, our real spirit of what we care about. That's true. Um, it brings up the issue that what we care about now may not be what we care about in the future. Like, let's let's go back, you know, a good 4,000 years, and um, or even more less than that. A lot of people were very interested in watching people fight to the death. Um, and, you know, it, incredible an animal cruelty. I think, uh, was it the Jewish or the Greeks used to, um, Israelites used to um, uh, have cats, like in sort of cauldrons and burning them alive. And you'd get m masses of people watching this and, and cheering. And mm -hmm. It's amazing, you know, what, what the human species will do to keep itself entertained. These days, mm. you know... I think it's good that we're we have we're against animal cruelty and we're against cruelty in general, but um, there seems to be some sort of biological drive to get off on that sort of thing. You mm -hmm. even see killer whales um, playing with seals, for instance. Yeah, I've seen videos of that. Yeah, um, before they eat them, you know, just throwing them about and having a bit of fun. Um, but you know. I mean, is is it? The, there's some values which maybe we have today uh, that we will want to make sure that that's not going to be a, co a constant thing in the future, and it's not going to shape the future of of um you know intelligent life in the universe. <laughs> I'm totally with you there. Yeah. That um, you know, I think the human psyche. I mean, you know, you look at literature from any era. It talks about the battle between good and evil, and in many cases, it's sort of a battle between the forces in our psyche which are aiming toward our own individual egoic you know, survival and thriving and the forces which contribute to the greater society. And I think every human has both of those inside of ourselves and the kind of more psychopathic type of personality um, has sort of downplayed the, the social good aspect. And I think you, know, you described sort of the barbarity of some of the cultures from, from thousands of years ago I think there's a, there's a general trend toward greater compassion and uh, greater understanding. You know, a couple hundred years ago, many cultures felt slavery was fine. Uh, slavery still goes on today, but no government sort of sanctions it. And so, so I think we're moving in a general direction toward greater compassion, greater 
uh, cooperation and creating a more uh, you know compassionate, positive society. But the seeds of the negative is certainly uh, in in every human mind, and so. Um, and I agree with you that we we don't want those to be the what gets expressed in these new technologies, and so sorting that out, like what is positive and what is negative, uh, I think is part of the challenge here. Yeah, I don't know if we can do it in one quick clean sweep either. Um, it may be more like a trajectory moving forward, and the more we know about ourselves and the universe around us, and the more we'll probably change what we want and what we desire and. Um, work out what works um, in different societies in the future. I mean, we we if we could just be incredibly uh, far more su like uh, superior in in terms of intelligence in you know maybe one hundred years, um, and then and then we've got millions and billions of years before the heat death of the universe. <laughs> yeah. So exactly. that's what we're gonna be. yeah, that's all right. So. so Exactly as you're saying, I would prefer these technologies to unfold in a fairly slow way so that as new developments come, we can integrate them, we can check them out, we can see how we feel, make decisions. Um, many people are talking about a sort of a fast takeoff where things change very, very rapidly. And I think it would be better for humanity to do it slowly so that we can make these decisions with a lot of forethought. I'm not sure that's going to be possible given the sort of political forces and the social forces. Um, but I think that's part of, in fact, I'm hoping that some of what gets discussed at this uh, upcoming summit is, you know, what do we want this transition to look like? Yeah, definitely. Well, we're looking at doing polls, um, and I might ask you if you'd be interested in um, submitting some questions for the polls that will uh, possibly vox pop on the streets do some at the summit and then after the summit as well online ones and whatnot i mean uh the I, iet have been doing that james hughes has been doing that for a while but oh, yeah. yeah so I, i'd be interested in doing something like that too i think it'd be fantastic sure. to have something like that at the summit get people thinking um and also having some sort of record of what people uh, and how people have responded to certain questions would be valuable as well we've had some more hard data some statistics to go with yeah so um yeah yeah so what do you think are the biggest misconceptions regarding existential risk uh so you know among individuals uh in the futurist community but also the broader general sort of public well i think most ai researchers haven't really thought enough about um what the consequences of the systems they're building are there are certain drives that uh, intentional systems uh, tend to have, and um, some of those drives are not uh, positive, if not uh, checked. So I think we need to build these AI systems in a very careful way. And so I think in the general AI community, there's less thought and concern about the consequences than there really should be. I think among the general public, who've been watching Terminator and all these movies, um, there's maybe a greater fear of AI than there should be. And so I think we have a bit of a disconnect between the scientific community and the general public there. Um, in terms of visions of the future, um, you know, I think most people's visions of the future are coming from uh, films, from our, from our movies. And I don't think they have done a very good job of portraying anything like what it's actually going to be. And so, so I, think, um, I think we don't really have good models at the moment. And so... Uh, to my mind, I think that would be of great value to, to really envision carefully you know, what, what do we want it to look like and, um, and try and create a compelling enough narrative that people can really you know, feel themselves actually living in that and, and, uh, and wanting it, and then we can create that. Yeah, definitely. Um, look, I've got Hugo de Garris sort of messaging me. I told him that I had an interview. Um, and actually, it's similar to one of the questions I have, and that's uh, what do you think about friendly AI? And can the super intelligence uh, stay human friendly, even the high, in a highly advanced state? Well, the vision I have for the way that uh, AI is going to go um, is to really create an ecosystem of humans and AIs um, interacting with a kind of a constitution which governs uh, the behavior of everybody. So that there'll be certain rights, like human rights, like property rights that uh, constitutions in, in countries today uh, govern for their citizens, I think we're going to need that same kind of a structure 
uh, as uh, these machine systems get, get uh, larger. And so I envision uh, many, many systems, you know, working with a, in a variety of ways and with a kind of governmental structure to uh, keep things uh, friendly. And um, others, I think, have a, a vision which is more that there's a single system which is going to be, you know, beneficent and will take over everything and create a, a, a sort of a friendly environment. That scenario makes me a little bit nervous. It feels uh, a bit um, fragile and that, you know, if you make a mistake in programming that single system, it might not do, you know, really what we want. Um, I think the idea of friendliness is good. I'm not sure the name. The name is a little too cutesy for my taste, but, but I think it captures, you know, um, we're really talking about the base infrastructure for what human society is going to look like. Uh, compute, computational devices is the sort of platform on which it runs, but really that's incidental. The technology is not the core thing. It's really, you know, how do we want interactions between humans to look? How do we want um, the, the nature of human life? What, what do we want that to look like? And so um, I think we want it to be friendly, certainly, but I think we want a lot more than that. I think I think there's kind of uh, there's more depth, I think, than that word sort of seems to capture. Sure. Um, there's a few different approaches to that have been put forward uh, to build friendly AI. Um, there's, you know, there's the um, sort of nanny AI, uh, which, you know, has some merit to it. I think Ben uh, spoke a bit about that during our last mm -hmm. interview. Um, there's, you know, the co coherent extrapolated volition where you have a seed, e seed AI that isn't necessarily conscious or, um, you know, that general enough to, to do its own thing, but is very intelligent and articulate enough to program the next AI um, or the, yes, and then there's the coherent aggregated volition, which is a, sort of a, a reshaping of the uh, coherent a uh, extrapolated volition. And the social safety net, which I think, um, is that a way that you describe your vision of a friendly AI? Well, so there's two things. There's where do we ultimately want it to end up? So like, what does the final state look like? Mm -hmm. And for me, I think the ideal would be a kind of ecosystem um, with a, a kind of constitution guaranteeing the kinds of values that we want. And then there's the question of how do we get from where we are today to where we're going? Um, on that path, um, there's a lot of opportunity for uh, mistakes, you know, uh, uh, people either maliciously using some of the new technologies or uh, new technologies not being, you know, uh, built correctly to lead to a lot of damage. And so we need to create a path which is safe uh, on the way there. And um, one of the challenges is that I think we need to use AI systems in order to design uh, this safe future that we're trying to aim toward. And so how do we ensure that the systems that we're using to do the design are themselves safe? And so one of the things I've been doing at uh, my company, OMI, is um, we've been building systems that have provable safety characteristics. And so they're limited, they're not uh, arbitrarily able, say, to self-improve themselves, um, that they have structures that keep them from uh, you know, running out of control, like they're guaranteed to only run on certain hardware and they're guaranteed to turn themselves off and they're guaranteed not to improve themselves in certain ways. And yet they're still powerful enough to um, design sort of successors to themselves. And so um, I think doing smart simulations of the final environment that we want and of intermediate systems and of the infrastructure, I, I think we need a kind of global immune system to um, protect us from inadvertent and mistaken uh, uses of some of these technologies. And that's going to be a huge design challenge, and I think we're going to need AI systems in order to do that. And so, so I think there's, there's a sequence of steps which enable us to unfold these things so that at every stage um, the risks are minimized. Okay. Yep. So, I mean, a lot of people think that you need to fix society's problems before it, it goes further, like, you know, some people are all about abolishing money and, um, you know, uh, getting rid of tax and, uh, you know, toppling down existing sort of social systems and get, getting rid of corporations. But um, do you think that we should really be fixing society before we start developing uh, these massively intelligent machines or 
very um, powerful technologies, or do you think um, otherwise, or is it? I mean, I think these machines are the way that we're going to fix society. That um, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of the failures, say, of today's corporations. I mean, look at the decisions. Like in this country, I, I think also in Australia, we had a huge uh, real estate crash that was based on um, not very sophisticated failure of uh, economic modeling, both on the part of people who purchased homes and the part of banks that lended to them. And if we had um, a more sophisticated economic modeling capability, probably that whole crisis could have been averted. And so um, I think having more intelligence in the fabric of our society will solve some of the most egregious of today's problems. Um, I think it's unrealistic to say, well, we'll just hold off on all this technology while we fix everything else. That just isn't going to happen. Would you vote for an AI president? Not today. <laughs> <laughs> Sometime in the future. I mean, I think the reality is that it'll, it won't, it'll probably be um, a person assisted by intelligent technology uh, at first. And then who knows what kinds of blends, you know, start showing up, uh, you know, as, as things progress in the future. So like an AI assistant that sort of uh, metaphorically sits on one's shoulder and um, sort of records uh, a sort of a, a, the, an ethical framework that that individual likes to work by and then... Uh, yeah helps filter through a lot of the noise in um, in stimulus or uh, in, in, in perception and, and helps guide the hand towards um, the, the right decision. Um, I think I was speaking to John Smart earlier this year, I got, a, got an interview with him too, and he was um, saying the digital assistant or digital symbiont would be sort of got, uh, would have um, embedded in it some form of learning as to what the that the person who owned its uh, ethical framework or um, idea ideology was and so you'd be at the supermarket and then you'd be looking at a can of tuna for instance and you'd reach out to get that can of tuna but then your digital assistant would say no not that can of tuna they hunt bluefin um, tuna and they're there's hardly any of them left or they're not friendly to dolphins and so um, either put some sort of sensor in the side of your hand which vibrates and, and tells you to move your hand towards a, the ethical um, sort of can of tuna and, and uh, yeah so <laughs> I thought that was interesting Emma. Yeah, I mean, that's a good idea because that puts direct economic pressure on companies you know if, if many consumers yeah. start avoiding purchases based on those kinds of ethical decisions that hits those companies in the bottom line and they will shift their behavior and so that sort of shortens the the distance between having an ethical value and having it actually having an impact in the world so i, I think that kind of technology could dramatically change uh, the way that decisions get made that's that's a really good idea and in a sense like it's sometimes people don't can't make the sorts of decisions that they'd like to because the amount of information that needs to be processed is just huge. Um, yeah, exactly. And so, you know, you could have these AIs mining this information so as to uh, try and extrapolate um, what would be the, the, the correct course of action based on your moral framework. Um, exactly. But I mean, then I think you one could... area that's hugely important now is um, nutrition and food. You know, mm -hmm. What food do you eat for your body? And most people, you know, in this country at least, we have, you know, many, many people with all kinds of diseases like diabetes and obesity because they don't know what foods are causing what in their, in their systems. And if you had AI systems which understood their own physiology and the makeup and the nature of the food, I think we could dramatically improve the health uh, of people because that's, you know, there's fundamental decisions there that most people are not equipped to make. Yeah, sort of like a, the quantified man sort of idea yeah. where, where you know you've got the um you've got all sorts of statistics that you like to be aware of about your current health um and that could be applied not only sort of um for the body but also mentally perhaps even and exactly. um yeah. Yeah. and and instead of having to sort of churn for all the data and um, remember to record every single piece of information you'd have assistance or some form of um augmented reality enabled technology that allowed you to record this information and that helped point you in directions that would be more beneficial for you and the society you lived in. Um, Absolutely.
Yeah, but then on the other hand, you could have the makers of these programs or digital assistants um, almost hip, hip, hypnotically suggesting to you to uh, that makes you feel good about buying something. You know, mm. Verna Vinci, I think in one of his books, which one is it? Rainbow's End. I don't know. Um, it's about like he says, there's this you've got to believe me technology. Mm. You've got to believe me technology and so that's about like re almost mind control in fact it probably is really in a sense yeah. you know you've got these um, sort of uh, people who you know the elites and oligarchy of, of uh, companies um, who are creating this technology and then like directing people to do what they really want and turning hu um, humanity into a, a system of puppets which mm. is uh, something we I don't I think there's want. a real danger for that that and so how do we compensate? We can potentially use AIs. You have your own personal AI to detect when that's being done on you and to unfilter, you know, uh, reverse whatever it is they're doing to try and manipulate you um, to in incorporate your own personal values. And so there's kind of an arms race, I think, uh, between systems. Um, but it's, you know, where does that lead? I don't know. I don't know. Mm. Yeah. Well, I guess that's one of the things we can maybe bring up in the panel at the conference.